Hello, welcome along to a brand new episode of Writer's Routine where we're chatting to Terry Hayes. Terry has been a journalist, a screenwriter, and he's back with a new book called The Year of the Locust. It's his second book, published 10 years after his best-selling, highly acclaimed debut, I Am Pilgrim. We talk about why this second has taken quite a long time, also why he has no choice in the way that he works, and why song lyrics are important in getting him into the story. In Pilgrim, it says that the that the spy world uh, is very interesting because you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Hotel California by the Eagles. Uh, it says also in Pilgrim, when you ain't got nothing, it's simple. You've got nothing to lose, Bob Dylan. And on and on. So you're looking for an access to an emotion. Well, people that write really good song lyrics know how to find an emotion in a very few words. Well, I don't steal their words, but I look for the emotion. I think that's the emotional content of this scene. So I start to think like that, and then half the time I have to play the song, and then I think this is all hopeless, and who would ever do this job, and this is ridiculous. So I look on my iMac and I read the newspaper and get really depressed, uh, and then, but I've freshened up. I... I, I I put aside everything. I think, okay, back on to it. There is more with Terry Hayes in this week's Writer's Routine. Yes, welcome along to the show. This is Writer's Routine, where we take a look through an author's working day. My name is Dan Simpson, and this week we are sponsored by Plotte. It's a writing software uh, that does what it says on the tin. It lets you outline faster, organise smarter. It plots, it helps you plan your books, and can really turbocharge your productivity. I'm very happy that Plotter continue to support the show. If you missed the fantastic offer earlier on in the year, well, you can make the most of that now at go.plotter.com slash routine. It's a simple software that makes your writing simple for you. When you open it up, you get a digital cork board where you can easily swap between the timeline, the outline, you can colour code everything so you can chop and change, you can move, you can pick up, you can leave, you can take, you can grab, everything's there. Details on your characters and places, your notes, your research. I find it's a much more organised way of having a notebook that's right there. You can flick to the part that you are looking for straight away. It's really easy to use. It lets you track the details of your plot at a scene level and switch and swap them however you'd like. Plotter helps you spend more time writing and less time worrying about everything else. And you can get 10% off the software with this show. Get over to the website, take a look around, and then make the most of that offer while they are supporting us. Get to go.plotter.com slash routine to get 10% off. I've stuck the link in the episode notes wherever you're listening. Go.plotter.com slash routine. Really good chat for you this week. And we don't do many of them at the moment, but this was recorded face to face. And I mean, I love chatting to any author that I can that is uh, kind enough to give me time. But doing it face to face... It just adds a certain, I, I guess, intimacy, for want of a better word. But it, it, it just lets us kind of communicate properly face-to-face, eye-to-eye. And you can pick up on cues and ask questions that I think you're not always able to do when we're recording remotely. I don't know. Have a listen and see what you think. We're chatting to Terry Hayes. Terry started his career as a journalist in Australia before moving to Hollywood to take a crack at the movies. And it paid off in, well, every sense of the term, really. He worked on films like Flight Plan and Payback and Mad Max 2 at a point where, he'll admit, Hollywood uh, paid the big bucks. Uh, We talk about that. And then his decision to leave L.A. after becoming... Well, 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 tired and disillusioned with the whole thing, really. Ten years ago, he started a career as a novel, publishing I Am Pilgrim. It's a best-selling thriller. Uh, the film is slowly being made, and a decade later, he's got a new book out. It's called The Year of the Locust. It's all about Kane, a CIA spy who can go to places that many others can't. Now, I am like halfway through, and there is so much detail crammed into the novel, yet it manages to be a thrilling and very thought-provoking. It's a, it's a, it's a, new, it's a new way 
of writing a spy novel, I think. And he has managed to cram a lot in. It's no surprise then that he had to cut hundreds of thousands of words while writing it. We'll talk about that in a sec. We also chat through why it took him 10 years to follow up I Am Pilgrim, how much pressure he felt putting out something, following up on his debut, which was incredibly successful, and why a lot of that pressure came from a deep respect of his readers. Also, you can hear why he invents challenges to stave off the boredom, why writing novels gives more validation than screenplays, and how the very last line of the novel came to him quite early. So let's get into it with Terry Hayes, author of The Year of the Locust, and we start things off chatting about what he sees in the place where he sits down to write. Well, I've written in many, many different places, but the one where Locust was written primarily was... um an office in a house that I no longer live in, but I had a big desk. I had some windows that looked out on a courtyard. I had an exercise machine. I had various filing cabinets, which were used just to deposit junk. And uh, and a, a MacBook Pro in front of me, a Hewlett Packard that ran uh, Windows because a lot of my old files were were on Windows and it's too hard to get to try to adapt to 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 the Mac operating system. And I had an iMac. The iMac was to uh, look at videos and things like that um, and read the news. And the work was actually done on the MacBook Pro. So there's. A, a lot around you. I know that you've you've been writing uh, all, all across the board, really, for a little while now. Have you have you learned in this time of s- stuff that you really do need around you, just to centre yourself, to let you know that that's what you're there to do? Are you t- the type of person who's more than happy to write anywhere? Oh well, I've had to write anywhere. I mean, airport lounges, um, <clears throat> departure gates, on movie sets in strange production offices in various places around the world, at directors' houses, um, oh, many, many places. Um, it's best if you have a room that can close the door. That would be helpful, but that's hard at an airport. But no, the, the only thing that I really need is to have the habit of getting up at a certain time in the morning having the same breakfast every morning um, and then sitting down and staring at the screen. And as far as I'm concerned, if you write five words, well, you've done a day's work because you don't go to bed till you're tired. And if you can write five pages, well, that's better. But it's the habit of doing it. If I go on holiday, I'm doomed uh, because I never want to sit down again. Who'd want to? It's terrible. I, I, I mean, no, I, I mean, I, I meet lots of writers, of course, and, um, you know, people that would like to be writers. And I say, oh, do you enjoy writing? Anybody that says to me that the answer is yes, I figure, well, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> yeah, it's not enjoyable. I, 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 I mean, Dorothy Parker, you know, part of the Algonquin Round Table, she, she said, I hate writing, but I love having written. And I think that's true. I love the sense of achievement and having told the story. But the actual process on a daily basis of doing that is nothing but com- confronting your own shortcomings and characters that won't do what they're told. Who'd want to do that? It's worse than having children. <laughs> Uh, now, now we will get to the new book in just a second, and we'll, we'll get more into the the working day. I'm, I'm very curious. I know there's been like quite a gap between the year of the locust. <laughs> oh, Dan, you're so, so so diplomatic. Ten years isn't quite a gap. <laughs> it's a long time. So, ten years between the year of the locust and I am pilgrim. And you mentioned getting into the habit. How did you find? getting back into that habit after 10 years of not doing it as well, at oh, least no, for a I novel don't. I was doing it every day for 10 years I never I never went any oh I watch kids play cricket I watch more horse riding lessons than anybody ever has to I would go and see drama productions I'd pick them up from school I, I look you know I had my children later in life uh, my eldest daughter is now 22 and my youngest son is 16 so there's four kids we we had four kids within six years and uh, I did not have, you know, in many ways I did not have the greatest childhood and um, I think that, uh, well, I know I made a decision 
that the kids would have their dad front and present during their, their childhood. And I was, but my wife didn't work. We were in a happy situation where she didn't have to. We travelled a lot before we had the children. But then when we had our, our first child and then the others came along, I wanted to be a dad. And that, so I was. So I split my time between, you know, being part of a family and just writing. I wrote a million words for a locust and there's 240,000 in the book I threw away 750,000 words but hey that was the process I chose or that's how the story took me and uh, so there was I finished Pilgrim and then not so long later I started Locust and nine and a half years after that I finished Wow there's so much to get into there isn't there I think because when do you remember finishing the first draft of Locust? Oh, there was never a first draft. So, uh, the, 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 the day I finished was the end of my draft because I rewrite as I go because I, I have to. I, it, when you do it, it, it's like Pilgrim. It, it's complex in its plotting and you keep making mistakes. You keep sending him off in one direction and then you get to something later on. You think, well, that's incoherent. He wouldn't do that or he can't go there or there's this problem about it. So you go back and you have to change it in order to make it you know sing earlier earlier on you have to read a lot of it through so of course you start you know let's say 50 pages before the thing that you want to change well in those 50 pages you find 10 other things that could stand improvement and um you know so it it's a constant state of of changing and evolving and reworking you know you, you've got to be out of your mind to do it i mean frankly i, I mean if you're a sane individual you, you wouldn't work this way and you certainly wouldn't write novels but hey the uh you know when i finally wrote you know we're writers on the storm that's all we are and can ever hope to be writers on the storm it, that was the end because everything else had been rewritten god knows how many times and out of every four words only one remained are you perfectly happy with that way of working i i don't have a choice I I, I, I I wish I did. If I had a choice, no, I wouldn't work like it. But everybody has a different way. A every project is different. Uh, look, you know, Dean Kuntz, who's a writer, a novelist, he's written 109 books. That's incredible. I look at that, my jaw drops. And I would never disparage that. That's an, an amazing achievement. On the other hand, J.R.R. R. Tolkien wrote, you know, two books, The Lord of the Rings Trilogy and The Hobbit. Who do you want to be? Do you want to be Dean Kuntz or do you want to be J.R.R. R. Tolkien? We all have a choice. Uh, Dean Kuntz chose one way. James Patterson chose another way. Uh, J.D. Salinger decided to write one book and publish no more. Harper Lee wrote one book. I, in my stupidity, thought, that I could be the J.R.R. Tolkien of the spy world. Well, you know, it's a small problem about talent, but leaving that aside, I had the ambition. And I wanted to write more epic books, and not many people write them anymore. So I did, don't feel I have a choice. Hopefully in the next book, I'll have to adopt a different working methodology um, to get it where I think it, 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 it's okay. We'll see. Oh, well, you know, you get up in the morning. As I say, I have the same breakfast every morning because uh, I. Uh, one of the things I think a, a lot of writers don't realise is that it, your health is going to be compromised because it's a sedentary job. So I get up in the morning and I try to eat healthy. I don't drink alcohol. I don't drink coffee. I don't smoke cigarettes. Uh, I used to do all of these things, but, but you know, I've got to try to live as long as I can. And that's so I get up in the morning. I had the same breakfast. I go and sit in the in front of the computer. And, uh, and it's all set up from the night before. I could just pick up from where I was the night before. I... And 
I had would have done the night before every night, emailed the document to myself and sent it to the cloud just in case uh, everything crashes, I can recover it and that. So I sit down, I read through the last page or two that I wrote when I was tired last night and I make a judgment about that and change it always change it because it can always be better and then I launch into that day's work now if it's something that I haven't had an opportunity to think a great deal about or it's one of those where I think oh this is going to be easy never is I make notes I I put down the salient moments that are going to happen in these next three or four pages or this next event. And I think, okay, that's what I've got to cover. The, and, you know, I have a little rule of my, myself. Every sentence must make you want to read the next one. Every paragraph must throw into the next paragraph. Every page has to make you want to turn it. Now, that's not by making it exciting. It's by making it interesting. So, to me, um, books like Locust and, and Pilgrim, they work within three time frames. They draw on the past. They project you into a difficult situation in the present that then throws you into the future. So every sort of like event that's happening, it has to tell you something about where somebody came from or why they're doing this. And it has to be revelatory. It can't be repetitive or stuff where the audience is, oh, well, that's useless. Or why would you ever want to include that? So you try to... to, to harken back to the past because in my view and nobody knows anything in this business so I'm no better than anybody else but this is my view you that gives you some depth to the characters and the events now you've got a situation in the present that he's got to solve you know somebody wants to crucify him or they're going to torture him or he's got to go and talk to his wife about something difficult so that's the present now I've got to know that that's going to project me into the future if he's talking to his wife about a difficulty in the present I know she's got to hit the roof in the next section so I'm trying to balance all of those things and because the books are long and hopefully epic I've got a lot of characters to deal with and I'm trying to do deal with it with all of them so it's a lot of juggling so each thing that I'm coming up to write I have to I make these sort of like bullet points and say, right, this is the stuff I know I've got to cover. Okay, what are the first words? Uh, I have to feel comfortable about that. And that normally comes from songs, lyrics of songs uh, or poetry. That's the easiest way in for me. Um, You've got to find the emotion in the scene. Now, how do you do that? So in Locust, he's sitting on a plane and he's heading off into really bad lands and he knows that. And he starts to... And he says in the book that he's feeling small. Now, that was a line from a Simon and Garfunkel song, Bridge Over Troubled Waters. And I could play that in my head and I knew the feeling. That's the emotion that I was looking for, that... It, it, when you're down and you need a bridge over troubled waters, I'll be there for you. Well, he was heading into troubled waters and there was nobody going to be there for him. So in Pilgrim, it says that the that the spy world uh, is very interesting because you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Hotel California by the Eagles. Uh, it says also in Pilgrim, when you ain't got nothing, it's simple. You've got nothing to lose, Bob Dylan. And on and on. So you're looking for an access to an emotion. Well, people that write really good song lyrics know how to find an emotion in a very few words. Well, I don't steal their words, but I look for the emotion. I think that's the emotional content of this scene. So I start to think like that, and then half the time I have to play the song, and then I think this is all hopeless, and who would ever do this job, and this is ridiculous. So I look on my iMac, and I read the newspaper and get really depressed, uh, and then, but I've freshened up. 
I, I, I put aside everything. I think, okay, back on to it. And then at some stage during the day, if I'm being disciplined, I'll get on my little stationary bike and and do a bit of exercise because who needs to die of a heart attack? And <clears throat> then my wife or one of the kids will yell out, come and have a sandwich. So I'll go and have a sandwich. And then I'll start again. And then we do it for dinner. And then at the when the kids are going to bed... Well, not now, they're older now. But I'd go and sit with them, put them to bed, and they'd say, how's your day, Dad? And I'd say, oh, it's great, it's a good day, I'd lie. Uh, why do they need to go to sleep worried about poor Dad? And that, and, uh, yeah, seven days a week. So what's really amazing to hear, and bear in mind, I've interviewed a lot of authors who, like, with respect, have published, uh, like, loads of books, OK? And not as many of them are as like analytical in the creativity as you are you know they don't sit down and say i like to listen to song lyrics i like to use that as a process of getting into my character now you 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 have written a lot before you started writing novels how much of that side of it the creativity getting into books how books need to be written the fact that every sentence needs to have a purpose make sure you read the next one how much of that have you thought about throughout your career of writing it seems to be something you've learned is that very conscious well yes i have learned it but i learned it from the best didn't i i I mean i learned it from tolstoy and tolkien and james clavell you know it what surprises me especially in the movies is how so many of the writers haven't read anything. I think it's sort of like that being like me being a bricklayer, but I don't know anything about cement. I, I, I mean, it, it, it's really shocking. And um, that, so I used to have the habit uh, as a child of rewriting books in my head. To this day, I don't know how a lot of the great novels that I read actually end because I rewrote them because I didn't like it when they were miserable. I didn't, uh, you know, there's a saying in movies, you know, sad is good, depressing is bad uh, in a movie. And I think that's very true. Um, Well, I found that out very young. I didn't mind the book being sad. I sure didn't like it being depressing, so I would rewrite it in my head. And to this day, I don't know if if the version that I know of is is the correct one or not. Uh, you know, I'm toying around. I, I have to write Pilgrim too, but I'm toying around with 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 another story, which sometime later I would do. And I thought up an opening to this story. And, and I thought, gee, that's a really, really good event to open a story with. And I thought, my God, you know what that event is? That's the ending of A Tale of Two Cities, Dickens. And I thought, Jesus, now that's a long time since I read that. But I remembered it emotionally. And I thought, I could steal that, couldn't I? I could steal that, adapt it, and use it as the opening of a book. So uh, I learnt from many, many people. But I do have, oh, thank, well, maybe not thankfully, an ability to to analyse my own work. That's how come you, you get to the point where you can throw out so many words. And a lot of people don't. Uh, 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 one thing movies teach you is you're not on a telephone line to God. You're not. You, you're, you, it, it's hard work, and you, you can craft it, and uh, and you can craft it better and better. And if you do that really well, then you might come out with something that's quite special. But the other thing the movies teach you, and I think it's partly where my analytical mind comes from, and that is that. Anybody can write art. Anybody can. It's called a diary. You can write it for yourself. And, and that's terrific. And, and I think a lot of people, not published, I'm not saying that, but a lot of people write as a form of therapy. And, and I think that's great. I, I have no problem with that. Then there are people who write purely for commerce. 
and you've made a lot of them in the movies and uh, that the idea is to write something and it makes a lot of money. Well, there's people that work in the publishing, uh, the, the novel writing business and do exactly the same thing. But to me, both in the movies and with novels, the trick has always been to try to inhabit that area where art meets commerce. Now, that's a dangerous place. If I write it for me, it's art. If I write it for you, it's commerce. I have to write it for both of us. Now, that becomes very tricky. And to do that, <clears throat> you have to walk the tightrope. And that's where the analytical part of it comes from. I'm having to say to myself all the time, is this true to myself? Do I really believe this? Not the character, but in the morality of it, the complications of it, the grey area of where, you know, nothing's quite, no decisions are easy. Do I believe he's making the right decision <clears throat> to, to shoot these people at a crucifixion? and jeopardise his whole career? Is that the right moral choice? Is that what my character would do? So I have to make sure it's true to what I believe in. On the other hand, I'm having to say to myself, yeah, what's the reader thinking? Are they thinking, what a wuss? How pathetic is this guy? Or why is he so anguished? Uh, the, the answer's clear. He should do such and such. So you're trying to... I'm trying to write it for myself and I'm trying to write it for an audience and who are the people that do that? They're the storytellers. They're the people that stand up in front of the, the campfire and everybody's worried about the saber-toothed tigers outside and everybody's gathered around and they're creating a world and they don't want to lie. They don't want to talk absolute rubbish uh, you know um, um, that's not true to them but on the other hand they want to engage that audience hey that's what I try to do it's exhausting I hate it <laughs> <laughs> when uh, I Am Pilgrim comes out immediately well you know it's, it's does very well critically and commercially but best selling sells millions of copies all around the world and uh, the film rights are bought and like for many authors they would want to just just immediately get something out get something out get something out now you've spoken about the reasons why or some reasons why you, you didn't immediately do that but was there a moment where you were worried where you were thinking oh i am you know this has been a while i do want to i do want to take advantage of, of some of that while i can no no no, no i was never worried I, I was very depressed after pilgrim came out uh and uh, nothing had prepared me for it. Why is that? Is it post-show blues? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, all my life, you know, as a migrant child, went to Australia when I was five. Very confronting, very, very difficult period for, for me anyway. I can't say for everybody at that age. My, my brother, who was three years older, <clears throat> he didn't have any difficulty at all, so I don't know, for whatever reason. And I found a refuge in reading. And I don't know. Around about the age of eight, I decided, well, reading was all right, but I was going to be a writer. And I never wavered from it. I became a journalist. I had, you know, quite a degree of success. I was a foreign correspondent when I was 21, a political correspondent, investigative reporter. And then I went into the movies when I was about 28, and the, you know... Uh, Road Warrior Mad Max 2 was met with acclaim around the world, uh, you know, rightly or wrongly. People have their own views about movies, but OK. Then I did a lot of other miniseries and movies, and, you know, uh, that, that, they were very good. Uh, you know, not just my judgment, publicly they were thought of as that. Obviously, it's a very, very lucrative world of writing to go into. I, I wasn't the first. F. Scott Fitzgerald and, uh, and Raymond Chandler and lots of people have written screenplays. And, that. and so, uh, but all the time I'd wanted to be a novelist. And I'd always be saying, oh, next year, next year. Well, finally, uh, next year came. Movies had changed a lot. I, uh, it had become very difficult to get movies made because of the budgets, many reasons. So I wrote a novel, I Am Pilgrim. And as you say, it met with some critical and commercial success. Well, you know, 
It's a Chinese proverb, be careful what you wish for. And there was a hole in my life. I, I mean, for 50 years, I'd been thinking about being a novelist and suddenly I'd done it. And I'd done it, if you believe the public, which I'm not sure I do, but, but I'd done it to a reasonable degree. So I didn't know what to do with myself. I thought, well, maybe I'll take up painting. Maybe, maybe I'll do something. I, you know, I'm very, I'm easily bored. I, I have to keep challenging myself. So I went through a period of finding it very, very difficult to, to deal with all of this. Um, you know, when you do a movie and it has a lot of success, well, there's always plenty of people that, that are more than willing to take all the credit, you know, uh, and that's, that's fine, that's all right with me. Uh, I know it's my name on I know what I did. But this was a solo. It's like playing, you know, I walked onto Centre Court at Wimbledon and uh, playing singles, and hey, I did sort of all right. And now I'm thinking, well, all my life, I thought I might play centre court at Wimbledon. Well, what now? And it, it, it's counterintuitively. I, I mean, everybody would think, oh, you're out of your mind. You, you know, you should be out there celebrating and buying nice things. I, I found it very, very difficult. But anyway... I thought, well, time comes a time to write a diff uh, to, to write another book, and I didn't want it to be Pilgrim Two. There was a huge pressure to do Pilgrim Two, and as far as what the public wanted, somebody went on Goodreads the other day and said I'd taken so long, I'd disrespected, I'd shown no respect for the reading public. I never answer these things. I don't read many of them, but I did in this case, and it, it was about Locust. And I felt like answering and saying, no, no, no. The problem was that I didn't... It's not that I didn't respect the reading public. The problem was I respected them too much. That was my problem. I wanted it to be as good as I could make it. Now, I don't know whether it is. Maybe it's not as good as Pilgrim. But I wrote the book I wanted to write, and it would take as long as it took. And, uh, you know... Uh, Plenty of people have have written a, a, a very good selling book, and then bought out another book a year or two later, and it's not even interesting. It's not that it was creatively not successful or whatever. It's not even interesting. A famous rock and roll singer whose name I can't remember, but he said a great thing. He said, "You you plan all your life for your first album. That's all you think about." And finally you get to make it, he said, and then you have to make the second one and you've got a year and it has to be better than the first one. He says, who can do that? Well, I don't know. Uh, uh, not many people. So, yeah, you know, look, if, if when I die I've written five books of which I'm proud, I figured I paid my rent. I paid my rent for my space on earth. Um, if I wrote 50 books, great. If nobody read any of them, what was the point? We're back with more from Terry in just a second. Thank you to Plotter, who is supporting the show this week. If you want to make the most of that offer, 10% off with us, get to go.plotter.com slash routine. And you can support us as well over on our Patreon page. If you're enjoying the show, if you've learned a lot along the way, almost 300 episodes now, uh, stuffed full of the best authors and loads of tips and advice. If any of those have at all impacted the way that you write, if you've taken a little tidbit and you've thought, oh, well, I can run with that. Maybe that might help me to do these things. Well, you can support us at patreon.com forward slash writers routine. It's really just me that works on this, doing everything. And we're on to YouTube music as well now. I'm kind of pumping uh, our videos out on there if that's how you'd prefer to listen. So there's a lot going on as well as bringing you uh, an author as often as I can, most Fridays really. And you can help that carry on by supporting the show. It doesn't take a lot, just a few dollars a month really helps us going by pledging and backing for as long as you like at patreon.com forward slash writers routine. Let's get back to it then with Terry Hayes, author of the fantastic new spy novel, The Year of the Locust. It comes 10 years after his debut, I Am Pilgrim, which was an international critically acclaimed bestseller. We talk about how, after a decade, 
and after oh, I think millions of words he knew it was finally done also you can hear why writing novels gives more validation than screenplays and we get back to it talking through the first idea for the year of the locust and how it came to him utterly crystal clear I knew what it was going to be and it's probably a cross I'll have to bear for the rest of my life. I thought, wouldn't it be neat? Wouldn't it be neat if you had a character? And this is exactly how it worked. There was no story. There was no nothing. It was just this. And I do this a lot. Set myself narrative problems that I have to solve. Imaginary narrative problems. What would you do if this happened? If this car suddenly runs out of control down there, who's it going to kill? Why is that important? OK. So I'm walking along and I'm thinking to myself, wouldn't it be a neat idea if you could get a character who's like in their mid-30s and they're in a battle situation fighting for their life but there's other people on their side who are fighting with them and it's this character's son and daughter but of course you can't put nine-year-old children in that situation or I didn't want to so I thought well the kids would have to be in their mid-20s I thought, how the hell do you have a 34-year-old man and two children, a boy and a girl, who are in their 20s, who are his children, and they don't know it's their father, and they're all trying to save each other's lives, and suddenly he starts to realise from things they're saying to each other that he might be related to them. I thought, my God, that's a narrative problem. But if you could pull that off, that's really a great moment when the kids save his life and he realises that they're his children. That's something extraordinary. I think, now, I could do that in a movie. I know how to do that in a movie. Could I do it in a novel? Well, that was nine years' work working out how you could get to that situation and I'm not giving any plot points away but he has to shift time that's the only way I could see of doing it and I'm thinking to myself well okay he has to shift time so what you know other people have done it H.G. Wells did it Terminator did it and that and I'm thinking about Terminator and I'm thinking oh yeah I mean, James Cameron wrote that was a brilliant script, a brilliant story, well told. And um, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, that's pretty neat. Somebody comes from another time frame and they know what's going to happen and on and on and on. So now you go down the rabbit hole. And that's where I went down. I went down the rabbit hole. I met all these people and I came up with some solutions which people will like and other people won't like. And it was trying to be very bold. And so that's what I, that's what I did. That was the kernel of it all. And, uh, you know, like Topsy, it just grew. <laughs> Rather grandly. What happens next then when you've got that kernel? Uh, you mentioned nine years worth of, of writing and a million words and narrowing them down. But on day one, when, you, when you've got the idea, the kernel, how much do you know about the rest of the story before you sit down and start typing? Well, I have to know the ending. I have to know the ending. And, you know, you have to ask yourself, you know, why do we tell stories or why do we write books or make movies or why is everybody engaged in this? Even, you know, the public are, are voracious in their appetite for storytelling. And the, the reason, in my view, nobody else, you know, I mean, partly it's educational, partly it's entertainment, but it's also emotional. So on that first day, what you're looking for is saying, is this emotionally ripe? Is this capable of delivering emotion to the reader or the viewer or whatever? So, you know, immediately I think to myself, father, two children, they're all in danger of being killed. Well, that's good. That's good because parents would do extraordinary things to save the lives of their children. If during the process they're discovering they really are their children and they're not just two brave young people fighting the good fight, then that starts to become turbocharged. And now you're thinking, OK, who's their mother? 
tell us who their mother is. And, yeah, you know, I knew that I would be dealing with a post-apocalyptic world in at least part of it. So, you know, I, I think about apocalypse now, apocalyptic apocalypse now, and I think of the doors. Now, this is the end, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, boy, was that the end. And I'm thinking I'm seeing some scenes of a post-apocalyptic world and... I'm listening to the doors in my head and I'm thinking, I'm getting that feeling. I know this is grim. Now what i got to do is make it real. That's my job. And not just describe the set design. i got to make it that really scary. And somewhere out of that came the final lines of the book. Riders on the storm. That's all we are and can ever hope to be, riders on the storm. I mean, Jim Morrison was a great poet. Uh, and, and that so yeah uh, you know we all live in that chemical soup of of entertainment and creativity and things that marked our you know mark our passage through life and uh, I thought that it's summed up Locust he discovers at the end that's all we really are riders on the storm if you can survive it man, you've done a great job. And that doesn't mean being a spy. It means surviving life, you know? You mentioned uh, heading over to Hollywood and uh, the more commercial side of, of, of writing and uh, coming from a place of being a, a journalist in, in all forms. It's a, it's a writing life that many listeners would love to have, I think. What did all these what has all these different ta- forms of writing going over to Hollywood right working on screenplays what has that taught you about novel writing when you got round to it well first thing it taught me was don't go to Hollywood <laughs> that's a useful lesson not the dream that <laughs> no. we imagine it is no no it's awful um, no, I mean, look, you know, you get incredibly well paid, which is one of the problems, so you end up with a lifestyle. Uh, that's dependent on that. It's maybe not such a healthy thing. Uh, When my wife discovered that she was pregnant for the first time, she's from California, grew up in Los Angeles, um, very nice part of Los Angeles, and um, we were in Paris, and she told me that she was going to have a baby. And uh, so we said, oh, my God, where are we going to live? What are we going to do? Because we'd always moved around a lot. And she said, well, I'll tell you one thing. We are not bringing up any children in L.A. with you working in the movie business. And that was true. It would have been the worst decision we ever made. I I mean, it's a distorted life anyway. Maybe if you're an adult, you're Australian and, you know, you have a jaundiced view of a lot of things, maybe you survive it. Your kids don't survive it. If they're not driving an imported German car, they know that they're part of the third world, you know. So, uh, so no, uh, that was one thing that it taught me. It taught me that it's a scary place for anybody to write a novel, and that's why there are no bad novels. There has never been a bad novel written in the whole history of the world because somebody sat down and wrote the first word and then wrote the end, and that is worth everybody's admiration and support. It's a very difficult thing to do. Every other form of writing that I've engaged in, in both movies and long form series and mini series and documentaries, everything else that I've I've done, there's always been a group of people that will help you and support you. Um, and if it goes badly wrong, well, there's plenty of people to blame. You're know, the writer, so you, you can say, well, they should never have hired that director or he was a moron or, my God, what were they thinking of casting that actor or... You call that music? What? That's not film music. That's rubbish. So there's plenty of people that you can blame. When you write a novel, there's nobody. It's just you. And that's a scary place to be. That's why I have undying admiration for everybody that writes a book. Uh, And that because it's not where they've come up with a good story and told it well or whatever. They've found within themselves something very precious because it's a long haul full of self-doubt and problems and all of that and they've kept going so you know 
the one thing that it taught me, I suppose, was that when it comes to novels, you've got to be the last man standing. You've got to survive it. And um, that now, you know, in Hollywood, you, you're getting everybody throwing ideas at you and you having very tight deadlines and all of those things. And you know you're going to be rewritten or you're rewriting somebody else. I mean, Pocahontas, an animated Disney movie with Mel Gibson, uh, actually voicing the lead role, that had 26 producers and writers on it, 26. What did one of the writers do? Take his kids along and say, now listen, listen, listen. Those two lines of dialogue, they were mine. Now we can go. Ah, that never appealed to me. They don't care how much money they pay you. That, that never appealed to me. Last question. Uh, nine years later, how did you know it was done? I mean, you mentioned the last line, but in a more grand sense of the word, what made you finally go, I'm going to hand this in? Warren Beatty says about movies, no movie's ever finished. There's just a point at which everybody agrees to give up. <laughs> and I got to a point where I knew I had to give up. I couldn't do any more. I'd given it everything that I had, for better or for worse. It, 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 maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, maybe it's indifferent. I don't know. Uh, uh, time will tell. I knew I couldn't do any more. I'd, given, I'd gone out onto the frontier of the genre. I had taken a lot of risks. I was full of anxiety. To be honest, I was exhausted by it. And I knew... I knew I could spend another three years doing it. It wouldn't be any different. Oh, it might be slightly different, but it wouldn't be any better. And uh, so, yeah, I think if you've had a lot of experience in writing in various formats, you get to a point where you know that it's such diminishing returns that you'd better open the door and walk out into the sunlight because if not, you, they're going to lock you up. Uh, moving on to the next book... Are you concerned with making that process easier? Are you happy to go on as you've done? It, it, it won't be easier, but it will be a lot quicker. The publishers <laughs> have written into the contract for Pilgrim 2 that I have to deliver on certain stages. Otherwise, I pay very significant financial penalties. Um, maybe that'll work. I hope so. No, I... I you know, it's the same with movies. They're all different. And they have their own life and they have their own fate and their own destiny. And it just so happened Locust had that destiny. I, I don't think the next book will. I think it will be a different thing written in different circumstances by a different person. Yes, there'll be a commonality in the name, but I'll be a different person. And, you know, maybe I don't feel that I'm going to get as down following the publication of Locust as I did after Pilgrim. I'm better prepared for it. I'm better prepared for the future. I've learned a lot about writing novels. Uh, I have. I hope I keep learning. And I, I know not to write words that I get wedded to until I know the story better. Hey, maybe it'll work. I hope so. Oh, my God, I hope so. <laughs> And that is it for this week's episode of the show. Thank you so much to Terry Hayes for coming on the podcast. That brand new book is The Year of the Locust. We're back next week with another author on the show. Make sure you follow us wherever you get your podcast so it automatically drops into your feed. You can support us too, patreon.com forward slash writers routine. Make the most of that fantastic offer with Plotter. Get 10% off the software, go.plotter.com slash routine. And you can always get in touch uh, at writersroutine.com. Use the contact page there. And I will see you next week with a brand new day in the life for you. Until then, bye.